What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Pass Gas. Today, we're talking about the early, early history of Chevrolet and how it became a major auto manufacturer here in the U.S. There's a lot of backstabbing, a lot of bad people involved, a lot of stonks involved as well. All you Wall Street bets types out there are going to love this one. There's a lot of chicanery in this story, uh, and it's awesome. So let's begin. I think this week I might take shots at Eminem. Oh. oh, that's historically worked out for everyone who's done that. <laughs> I think now I'm ready to maybe take some shots at Eminem. Yeah. Do you have bars? Is my I, question. I don't. Oh shit. <laughs> Did you hear that Melly Mel Eminem diss? It was like huge on TikTok. Wait, like the rapper from the '80s? Yeah, the rapper from the '80s, Melly Mel. Ugh. Like hates Eminem. The guy who's like. I'm driving in my yeah, car. Yeah. I'm going real far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like, and he was like, he was like, Eminem, the only reason they put him in the top five is because he's white. And then he wrote a diss track of him. And there's all these like, you know, uh, like reaction videos mm -hmm. to yeah. rap songs is like a thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all these dudes are just like, oh my God. <laughs> like literally at one point in the dude, he goes, and walk your, walk your way back to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mile. Oh God! It's like they, they're like, dude, you you had a verse that's thirty two yeah. bars long, yeah, and you wasted like four of them counting to eight. <laughs> <laughs> but then he's like, you remember that when I said that in the yeah. song forty years ago? It was just, it's so like, oh wow, this genre has really come a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, at this point, it's just a way to like get back in the news, mm -hmm. you know. I think if I were to go come after Eminem, I would go after his like diet coke addiction. Is he addicted to that coke? Oh. He drinks like with no ice. He he's got a machine no in his ice. studio, and he'll drink like big slurps of them. Big slurp. And, you know, like the big slurp cup. <laughs> big gulp. Big, big gulp. gulp. <laughs> big slurp. <laughs> big I'm slurp. thinking of a slurpee. Uh, but then he just like leaves <laughs> half empty ones all around his studio, like signs. Yeah. Joe, <laughs> Joe, you let it slip. Joe's wow. been recording with Eminem. Yeah, wait a minute. How do you know that? <laughs> he knows all about his studio. Well, I mean, I, I met Royce to 5'9 on the L train. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they have L trains in Detroit. Probably. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Probably full of, like, dogs. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Chevrolet isn't just a company, it's an American institution. The makers of the Corvette, Corvair, Camaro, Tahoe, Tracker, and Trailblazer have been around since what seems like the beginning of time. Becoming aware of Chevy is like learning the lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody. You know it must have happened at some point, but it feels like you've simply always known it. But the story of Chevrolet and its beginnings is hardly straightforward and far from inevitable. It involves backroom deals, betrayals, corporate ousters, and fortunes gained and squandered. Two men, Louis Chevrolet and William C. Durant, are responsible for the creation of Chevrolet, but neither of those men had anything to do with the company just nine years after its founding. Today on Past Gas, the story of a world-conquering company that almost wasn't. How did the men who made Chevy lose it so quickly? How did the company nearly get shut down by its own board, then come back to overtake Ford in sales only seven years later? How did an up-and-coming lawyer flip Chevy's attitude about safety even quicker than a Corvair could flip itself? Nice. All that and more on today's episode of Pass Gas. It's the beginnings of Chevrolet and the man who stole its name, William Durant. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Shopify. That's right. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash gas. Uh, hello. Welcome to Past Gas. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined by my co-hosts. You know them. You love them. James Pumphrey, what's up, man? Uh, doctor, can you check out this 
a weird bump on my back. I think it might be a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Weber. Uh, what's up, Wake Wake Nation? Drink it in. Drink it in. Drink it in. It's the freaking weekend, baby. We are recording at 828 a.m., a which early. is a lot earlier yeah. than we, we gotta, normally do. We got to send Nolan off to his uh, yeah. European Nolan's got to go to the airport because he's going to a place called Spain. <laughs> he's going to Spain to eat a bunch of snails out of a can. I'm going to I'm gonna cram like my uh, junior year Spanish. Oh, that was that's um, different than what I thought. <laughs> I'm going to study Spanish on the way over there. Oh, that's say. good. You really yeah. put it off to the last second. I, I've been busy, man. <laughs> it's a long flight. I know. I know. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to it. And by the time you hear this, I'll probably be back. And it, <laughs> he's going to have an accent when he gets back. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. But like a really weird one. Yeah. yeah Sorry. Not Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, guys. <laughs> hey. <I> just, <laughs> You need to. I think you need to like chill out. Yeah, <laughs> I just to, like, watched uh, Zorro last night really? to go no to sleep. No way. Yeah, Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas. Whoa, mm. um, whoa, that is a small world. Are you gonna see Zorro? I th- are. Did you? Do you have plans to meet him? Uh yeah, that's actually on our itinerary. That's Zorro's sick. Mexican. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but then. I can see getting confused because Anto- Antonio is Spanish. Antonio is. Which yeah. works against the story. Sure it's, does. You know. So, I don't know. I'd I, love to meet Zorro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'd get along. No. But I'd like to see how I could sword fight him. Oh, he would whoop your ass. You, you could think Zorro could be me in a sword fight? <laughs> yeah, but you could shoot him, though. I'd shoot him, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could shoot him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could always <laughs> shoot him. He could do yeah. all his fancy. It'd be like Indiana Jones, yeah. where he's just like, whoo, 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 and then you just pull the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> AR. <laughs> <laughs> Zora, more like Holo. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah, dude. Freaking killing people with me, guns. Uh, That's why it. you're going to beat Eminem in a rap battle. Yeah, me and Eminem, I'm going to take him and ten at him. <laughs> And synonym. I got some synonym for cinnamon. What's your favorite Chevy? <laughs> My favorite Chevy? Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no there ain't no synonyms for cinnamon. cinnamon. <laughs> favorite Chevy right now. Tell My me. Favorite Chevy. Oh, it's gotta be. Oh, probably Chevelle. I was gonna say Chevelle as well. Chevelle S. Oh, like a, that's a, a rhyme right there, dude. What? Chevelle, Chevelle as well. well. Chevelle as oh, well. Nice. Oh well, Phil. Hey, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Come to show and tell. Keenan and Kel. <laughs> Key and Pell. <laughs> <Bell. Joe. laughs> uh I I really want um a four fifty four SS, the little C ten. Oh what am I thinking uh, of? that's a you that's a Silverado. Yeah. Uh, it's a 1500 size body. Okay. But it has the 454. Yeah. That's a good choice. Yeah, those are cool. It's a good choice. Yeah. That's cool. What about you, smartass? Hmm. <laughs> what about the man who threw in the question? I, I Chevelle is definitely up there. Uh, yeah. Cobalt SS. No. Cobalt SS. No. Yeah, HHR SS. <laughs> Final answer. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you guys and the audience. Please. I'm really more of a big time Mopar guy. I've yeah. never really liked Yikes. Chevy too much. Uh oh, maybe yeah. we can sway Nolan. Hopefully, with this story of betrayal and backstabbing, maybe yeah. maybe mm, my my You will love be those. I I do love those. <laughs> you love betrayal and backstabbing. I do. That's how you got here. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Louis Chevrolet was born in Neuchâtel, Switzerland in 1878. Louis' family didn't stay in Switzerland long, however, and moved to Bonn, a major town in the (laughs) wine region of Burgundy, when he was just nine. Louis' family were watchmakers, and this meant that he was always on time and was encouraged from a young age to not just tinker with machines, but to understand them in all their facets, 
like how individual systems could lead to a whole, how the durability of component parts mattered, and how important precision was in manufacturing to a product's overall quality. But Louis, he pined after adventure, not countless hours spent poring over springs and gears at a workbench, James. So, no, not like me. true to his roots as a watchmaker's son growing up in one of France's most illustrious wine regions, Louis invented a wine pump in his early adulthood. I don't know what that means or what that is. Maybe it's a uh, pump that goes into a barrel so you can either that sounds, test it or just pour it. That sounds likely. Or... It's a pump that shoots it out of a fire hose at, like, a DJ set. Oh. Oh. We don't know. Like Steve Aoki. Like Steve Aoki or so many Dylan Francis's. (laughs) It was also during this period that he was introduced to what would become a lifelong passion, racing. At six foot one and 210 pounds, Louis was a colossal man for his time. Dude, in in the 1900s, early 1900s. That's like our size. a big boy, yeah which meant that he had a sporting advantage over his peers. Louis began to build his own bicycles and was often seen riding through the hilly vineyards of Burgundy. He had found racing. Although he was not yet racing automobiles, his family's pedigree meant that when William Kissam of Vanderbilt, a grandson of railroad king Cornelius Vanderbilt, rode into town on a barely functioning steam-driven tricycle, what? the Chevrolet family was asked to repair it. <laughs> Dude, I just found out that my friend Joe, his real name is Cornelius. That's cool. Yeah. Why would you not go by Cornelius? Because people call you Corny. Uh, uh, cornball. I'm going to change my last name because I'm getting married. Uh, and so, like, we're Ellie and I are going to make up a whole last name. Mm-hmm. And, and did you choose Pepperidge? Vander- <laughs> oh, Pepperidge is good. Yeah. Vanderbilt's at the top of the list. I'm thinking Vanderbilt, what Getty, about Centipede? Rockefeller, <laughs> De Niro. Oh, you want to be a robber baron? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm looking to get into this Nepo baby baron. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And those are really relevant names nowadays. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Getty is for sure. Yeah. I think I would go. What about Stinkbug? Oh, James <laughs> Stinkbub. Uh, right now, the number one, the number one, Nolan and I were driving the other day and we saw a sign out in Inglewood. Mm-hmm. And right now, the number one choice is uh, JP Termite. <laughs> yeah, I like that. James Pishigan Termite. <laughs> Pishigan. Pishigan. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to change my name to Soros. Soros. Joe <laughs> Soros. <laughs> Joe Soros. Yeah. yeah. You sound sounds like sneaky. a di- Sounds like a dinosaur. <laughs> Joe oh, Soros. Joe Soros. Yes. Soros. It's Joe Soros. It's like a T-Rex, but really long arms. Yeah. Let's change all of our last names to Soros, and we'll be like the Ramones. <laughs> oh. Okay, so while not powered by an internal combustion engine, this weird Vanderbilt tricycle inspired Louis and showed him that legs were not the only way to power a vehicle. <laughs> Louis parlayed his experiences into a job at Darac a French bicycle manufacturer that was moving into the automobile market. He moved to Paris, or Paris, in 1899, just as Dirac was releasing models with true internal combustion engines I rather than steam engines. Dwayne Dirac Johnson. Yeah, there you go. The young racer saved his money and soaked up what knowledge he could, like an old sponge in the sink. But like so many other working-class Europeans, working class, this guy makes wine and makes watches. Yeah, he's yeah he's I friends with the, he's the, the with the Vanderbilt. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Louis, he sought better economic prospects. In 1900, only a year after moving to Paris, he immigrated to North America in search of adventure, fortune, and the American car industry. And guess what, guys? He would find all three. Spoiler: Louis's first job in North America was as a chauffeur in Montreal. Due to the unreliable state of cars and the roads that they drove on, chauffeurs at this time were mechanics and orienteers as well as drivers. What's an orienteer? Is that like a navigator? I don't think we're supposed to say that word anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Louis learned how to drive a car, how to navigate in a car, yeah. and how to speak English during this time. <laughs> an orienteer just orients you? Like tells you where, yeah, you're, tells you where to go. Yeah. Talk about being distracted while driving. Jeez. <laughs> but Louis wouldn't end up sticking around in Quebec. In 1901, he moved to New York to work for the American division of Didion Bouton, another early French car manufacturer. At this point, Louis was well-versed in the working of cars, so he found the time to turn to his other passion, racing. But this time, the venue was the track, not the hills of Burgundy. Driving a Fiat, 
Louis entered in the 1905 running of the three mile long race in the Bronx. <laughs> three miles long. That's sick. Only 10% of the cars that entered finished. Yeah. <laughs> Louis. 19 per- people died. <laughs> <laughs> Louis' performance immediately put him on the map in the burgeoning world of racing. Not only did he win the race, but he set a new record for the mile at 59 seconds with an average speed of about 68 miles per hour in 1901. Or, yeah, that's... In the Bronx. In the Bronx. Yeah. That's hauling ass, dude. The next year, Louis helped design a car that featured an engine from his old employer, Duroc. He drove this car to a top speed of 118 miles per hour, obliterating his previous record. But Louis wanted more power. Baby. More- hmm? Baby, more technology, and more speed in his cars. That meant going to Buick, and going to Buick meant negotiating with William C. Durant. I feel like 118 miles per hour in 1906 is very, very fast. Yeah. Like going in 60 miles an hour in the Fiat, which was made 40 years ago. Probably had like bicycle tires. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. William C. Billy Durant was born to a prominent Michigan family in December of 1861, just eight months into the Civil War. Do you think he made people call him William C. Billy? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mr. Durant was my father's name. Call me William C. Billy. (laughs) (laughs) Despite his family's relative comfort and Durant's aptitude, he dropped out of school at the ripe age of 16. After he announced this intention, his mother asked... But what are you going to do? His (laughs) reply, I'm going to work, mother. (laughs) Work, mother, yes. Work, mother. Work, mother. Work, mother. (laughs) Yes, mother. Yes, mother. (laughs) Work, mother. That's how he said it. Uh, Work, mother. (laughs) It's giving me work. William C. (laughs) Billy, work, mother. (laughs) 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 Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> William C. Billy. William C. Billy, it turned out, was a natural salesman. Walter Chrysler would later say he could <laughs> coax a bird right down out of a tree. <laughs> it was so easy back then to like say, like make up sayings. I know. It's like mm. he could he could fart a turd out of a yeah. toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that dude just got away with words. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really powerful fart after you've taken a shit. <laughs> I got a good fart on turn out of a toilet. So stupid. <laughs> That's how comfortable he made people feel. <laughs> After stints in cigar and insurance sales, Durant got involved in Flint's fledgling carriage industry. Flint, Michigan. And then he took over the water. What? Uh huh. The carriage industry taught Durant a thing or two about the manufacture and sale of personal vehicles, however they may be powered. When the horseless carriage came on the scene around 1900, Durant was skeptical. He thought the fumes and slow pace (laughs) made it. Are you okay? No. Am I too funny? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Go ahead. Sorry. So he was... He was skeptical of this horseless carriage. He thought that the fumes and slow pace made it unlikely to overtake the horse and buggy. Yeah. Yeah. Those, uh, cars are so much stinkier than horses. Oh, cars stink yeah. so much. And listen, guys, I mean, look at it. It doesn't even have a big giant dog. <laughs> <laughs> How am I going to know if it's a good one or not if it doesn't even have any sort of big giant dog? <laughs> <laughs> There, there are early cars where they had the fake horse hood or a fake horse uh, head. Yeah, yeah. Really? Did not scare other horses. Yeah. Oh my god! I wonder. I wonder yeah, if anyone put a dog. Yeah. Up. Yeah. How am I supposed to pick a good car if it doesn't have some hose-like appendage coming down the bottom of it that I can grab and tell if it's a good one? This car ain't even got a big giant schlong. <laughs> How's it going to leave 10 pounds of nuggets on the road <laughs> if it doesn't even eat? The thing doesn't even eat. 
Wait, what so do you do I, when it's dead? When the car it runs out of gas, what are you supposed to do? Not shoot it in the head? Yeah, why well, <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot this thing in there? It probably just goes sputter, sputter, sputter. Wait, so I buy two cars, okay? And it can't even use its big old shawl on another one to make me more cars? <laughs> that sounds like bad economics, moron. <laughs> Everyone knows. The main attraction of transportation is looking at that shawl. <laughs> That's why I get the front seat in the wagon. That's why I always get the front seat in the wagon. So I gotta buy two cars <laughs> and a carriage, <laughs> and they pull the carriage? <laughs> well, I gotta wait till I get home to look at my horse's doll? <laughs> <laughs> what am I gonna do with these opera glasses? <laughs> <laughs> The technological advancements made cars an ever more attractive proposition, and by 1904, he had taken control of the Buick Motor Company. He made Buick into one of the very first profitable auto companies by producing some of the fastest and most advanced cars of the age. They had big old dongs on the back. They had big dongs on them. Buick means dong in French. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Buick. <laughs> as an up and coming driver, Louis sought work as a racing driver for the Buick team. That's how it goes, boy. Buicks were equipped with the then revolutionary overhead valve engines. That's sick, which delivered more power and were easier to service than the flathead engines of the day. But. Securing a job on the Buick team meant negotiating with Durant, the head of Buick. So, in the spring of 1907, Louis Chevrolet and his brother Arthur, whose occupations as full-time racing drivers made them no stranger to bravery, simply walked into Durant's office and asked for the job. That's what you do, man. Eh, pardonnez-moi. I have a job. I like to drive the race car. Uh, and I want to drive the Buick. I like to uh, drive the Buick. You will let me drive the Buick. I like to drive the Buick. I can drive, yes. I like your car because it has a penis. Okay, Durant admired their chutzpah and invited them to race his cars on a nearby track. Louis Chevrolet won the race and Arthur lost. Oh. But once the race was over, it was Arthur that Durant approached immediately with a job offer. What? Durant wanted Arthur to drive Buicks for him, but not as a racer, but as a chauffeur. Oh. Louis, oh. incredulous, so asked why. Blue. Durant replied that he had observed both Arthur and Louis driving, and that Louis was daring, brave, and determined to win, while Arthur had taken no chances. <laughs> so Durant figured Arthur was a, was perfect as a chauffeur, but Louis was perfect for the race team. Okay, uh, that's cool. It is a Mr. Act. <laughs> so Durant hired both Chevrolets, one to drive him and one to drive for him. The yeah, Buick I own two Chevrolets. Yeah, yeah. I own. Louis and Arthur. <laughs> The Buick Racing Team, headed by Louis, won more than half of all automotive races contested in the United States between 1908 and 1911. Good Lord. Louis Chevrolet parted with the Buick Team only a few years after to become a free agent, seeking ever more checkered flags and cash checks, baby. But before he left Buick, he mentioned to Durant his desire to build an affordable, yet elegant and well-designed small car. That was affordable and elegant, yet well-designed <laughs> And small, but affordable, and a car. But small. And also affordable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Easy on the wallet. Henry Ford's Model T, introduced in 1908, had proven that economy cars could sell. Durant, flush with cash, and by then, the president of General Motors, agreed to bankroll Louis' small-time tinkering. He figured that if it came to nothing, he wouldn't be out that much money. But... Durant was wrong. Durant, fresh off of what would be the first of his ousters at General Motors, was looking for a way to take back control of the company that he had started. Ford's Model T was ascendant by 1910, with production almost doubling from the previous year. Meanwhile, the bank trust that now controlled GM discontinued the Buick Model 10, the only car in the GM stable which was close to the Model T in volume and price. Durant had his opening. On November 3rd, 
1911, William C. Durant and Louis Chevrolet founded the Chevrolet Motor Company in Detroit, Michigan. Louis' tinkering had already resulted in a prototype car, which was officially the first automobile ever made by Chevrolet, the C-Series Classic 6. Large, powerful, and engineered with precision, the Classic 6 was true to Louis' roots as both a racing driver and the son of a watchmaker. You son of a watchmaker, you <laughs> Louis. You son of a watchmaker, you've done it again. Uh, clean your clock. Clean your clock. I mean, regular. I mean that regular. <laughs> 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 I meant that regular. Clean it. <laughs> it's filthy. The car's dual overhead cam 4.8 liter engine put out a then burly 40 horsepower. It had electric lights and ignition that came standard. Nice. That's a luxury option. That yeah. is. Instead of what? Like a lamp the cranker? The cranker. The Classic 6 was, in short, everything Louis Chevrolet wanted. Problem was, it was exactly what William Durant didn't want. It was complicated, expensive, time-consuming to produce, and at $2,150, targeted a completely different consumer than the Model T, which only cost $590 wow. at the time. Wow. More than uh, four times. Yeah, that's not a very good job, Louis. Ford sold just under 69,000 nice cars that year. The Chevrolet Motor Company sold 402. Mm. You got to get your numbers up. Yeah. Durant had not got the well-made economy car that he wanted. Undaunted, Durant recapitalized the company, moved to Detroit from New York, and gave Louis another chance at building an economy car. But Louis' taste for more powerful and elegant cars was unchanged. After Durant refused to allow two more refined yet expensive prototypes to be put into production, Louis and Durant's relationship was hanging on by a thread. The last straw for Louis was Durant's personal jab at his affinity for cigarettes rather than cigars. <laughs> what a time. That's where I draw the line. Different time. Durant, viewing cigarettes as effeminate, refused to allow the hulking Swiss to smoke them during meetings. You gotta have a big thing in your mouth to yeah. be masculine. Yeah. No little things. You want a big you wanna be sucking on a big yeah. thing. Like a horse's dog <laughs> in your mouth. I don't wanna see you inhale it at all. Is it what is that? Some sort of bird stung? <laughs> <laughs> A little white seagull? You smoking on that? Yeah, you like <laughs> smoking on a little tiny seagull dong? <laughs> no. You need a big old brown horse dong <laughs> that's all wet from you chewing on it like a man. And you got to circumcise it before you put it in your mouth. Circumcise it in front of your colleagues during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you have a piece of jewelry that cuts the tip off of it. <laughs> what do you not understand? It? <laughs> Those don't even have a decorative wooden box. I have a wet closet that I keep all my little smoky dogs in. And sometimes I go hang out in there with my boyfriends and my wife's not allowed to bother us. <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Big thank you to longtime sponsor of Past Gas. It's Indeed. That's right. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically doing it on hard mode, okay? I'm talking like playing Dirt Rally with no assists on. It's hard, okay? But all you got to do is what I do when I'm playing really hard games. You need to breathe, take it easy, and keep it simple, okay? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. I want to tell you guys today about Indeed's hiring platform. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. And Indeed does the hard work for you. Indeed shows you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash past gas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash past gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash past gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? 
You need Indeed. Thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. I'm so bad at remembering what I subscribe to. Sometimes I look at my debit card statement and realize that I've been paying for stuff that I haven't even used in months. It sucks. But there is good news. Rocket Money can help you out. The average person has around 12 paid subscriptions, and they might not even remember subscribing to half of those. If you have no idea just how much you're spending each month, you need Rocket Money. It's a great app that tracks all of your expenses so you know exactly where your money is going. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. When you're signed up for so many things like streaming services, it's so easy to lose track of what you're paying for. So stop wasting money on things you don't use, cancel your unwanted subscriptions, and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash gas. That's rocketmoney.com slash gas. Rocketmoney.com slash gas. Thanks, Rocket Money. Louis, pissed at his business partner's attempt to tell him what to do, reputedly said, I have sold you my name. I have sold you my automobile. I shall not sell my personality to you. Louis did sell Durant one more thing. His shares in the company. Slam. Pocketing $10,000 for the sale, Louis left to return to the world of car racing. He would never return to the management of the company that bore his name, nor reap the benefits of the untold millions that company would earn throughout the rest of his life. The fate of of the Chevrolet Motor Company was now, for all intents and purposes, in the hands of William C. Billy Durant alone. <laughs> <laughs> Work. Um, $10,000 back then was $321,000. So, Pretty small know, price, I think. Yeah. yeah. Durant's nose for publicity and desire to be close to the stock market led him to do something that no one had done before or since. Make automobiles in Manhattan. While that scheme was undoubtedly expensive in the midst of Manhattan's rent and labor costs, Durant figured correctly that something this audacious would more than pay for itself in terms of media coverage. That's so weird to make cars in Manhattan. Hey, you know where it sucks to drive? (laughs) Nobody drives. The New York factory was set to build Chevrolet's two newest models, the Royal Mail and the Baby Grand. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Some of these cars looked like baby buggies. A little baby Ooh, Royal Mail is sick. Yeah, it is. While both were more expensive than the Model T, they came with overhead valve engines, self-starters, and electric lights, which was unheard of at the under $1,000 price point. I respect a self-starter, like Elon Musk. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dakota Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> she loves limes. Uh, the 1914 Chevrolet 490 followed, named for its sticker price of 490 bucks. Consequently, Chevrolet's sales increased tenfold from 1914 to 1915. William C. Billy Durant finally had an economy car that could take the fight to Henry Ford. But while Ford was committed to centralizing his operations, Durant leased plans from Oakland to St. Louis, hoping to lower distribution costs once those cars were assembled. I mean, that's kind of smart, too. Yeah. The up-and-coming car industry soon attracted the attention of another Gilded Age industrialist, one Pierre Dupont. Oh, thanks, Pierre, for all the chemicals in yeah. my blood. The family chemical company, Dupont, had secured numerous contracts to provide chemicals to the European nations then fighting the First World War. Like mustard gas. <laughs> Pierre Dupont, flush with cash, saw the potential of the automobile industry and invested heavily in General Motors stock. Durant, still an owner of a large swath of stock after his first ouster, came to know Pierre Dupont as another investor. Both men were eager to wrest control of GM from the bankers who had forced Durant out in 1910. Durant wanted revenge, and Dupont wanted control. They would get it. Durant and Dupont. Dude, du- <laughs> I don't think du- I like Chevy was never my favorite Dupont. company, but I really don't like them. It's like a guy who is not Chevrolet. Yeah. Who kind of like broke up with Chevrolet, who seemed like a pretty into car guy. Yeah. Like the dude who was into cars yeah. was Chevrolet. And then he's like, I don't like that you smoke like a girl. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, all right, I'm out of here. Like, that's yeah. so crazy. Yeah. And then he's like, uh, let's meet up with this poison man. <laughs> well, it's, 
There's no like passion behind it. It's just yeah. money mm-hmm. from the start. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. evil. Yeah. 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 So Chevrolet and it fits. Yeah. It fits. GM's board of directors was scheduled to meet on September 16th, 1915. Although stripped of control of GM's operations, Durant was still a major stockholder in the company and thus entitled to show up at board meetings. James Storo, the banker who had orchestrated Durant's first ouster from GM, had run the company in the meantime. Yet, he hadn't done so since his ouster years before. So, when they woke up that morning, GM's board scarcely expected a coup. But a coup they would get. Using the money he had earned from Chevrolet, Durant had been quietly buying up every piece of GM stock he could get his hands on, adding to the mountain of shares he had taken with him when he left. Hostile takeover! These shares, combined with the thousands under control of Pierre Dupont and his lieutenant, John Jacob Raskub, meant that Durant walked into the board meeting and said, quote, Hey, uh, there won't be any trouble, Mr. Starro. I'm in control of General Motors today, don't you know? (laughs) And he meant it. Durant's coup put himself and DuPont in control of GM in terms of board of director votes. But Starro wasn't going to make Durant an executive so long as he could help it. Durant, of course, wanted to reassert control of the first car company he had built from the ground up. I mean, yeah, kind of. This is like succession. Yeah. Yeah, it's like succession. So Durant played his trump card. Chevrolet. He recapitalized Chevy, then offered five shares of Chevrolet stock to each person who would trade him a single share of GM stock. There was no shortage of GM stockholders who believed in Durant's business acumen, and many people took him up on this offer. Only a few months after his initial coup, in January 1916, Durant announced at a board meeting that he and Chevrolet controlled more than half of all outstanding shares of General Motors. GM, which sold 102,000 cars the previous year, was now under control of Chevrolet, which had sold just 20,000 over the same period. It's like a big slam dunk, like a Kevin Durant dunk. (laughs) (laughs) Where you go, William C. Billy? Louis Chevrolet, having sold his stock to Durant years before, was not part of this boardroom coup. Oh, God. Durant, in fact, obscured Louis' contribution to the company during the fight, saying that, quote, Chevrolet is my newest, latest, and best prized baby. Don't you know, <laughs> dedicated to and controlled by the man who built it up against terrible odds. Don't you know? And we all smoke like men. Big old horse stonks. <laughs> Let's go celebrate in my humidor. <laughs> Despite the company bearing his name, Louis Chevrolet was not in control of Chevrolet, and Durant's admonition that Chevrolet is, quote, my baby, meant that the Swiss racer was little more than an afterthought for Durant. Yeah. That's what they think. In reality, I think about Louis every day. (laughs) Reasserting control over GM meant that Durant had to identify and keep the talent that had been installed by the previous regime. The first person on Durant's list was a promising young executive at the head of Buick, a guy named Walter Chrysler. (laughs) Chrysler had made Buick GM's most prosperous division, both in terms of volume and profitability. Storo and the outgoing management wanted Chrysler to jump ship, but despite owing his career to Storo, Durant made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I kind of half expect... Walter Chrysler to have kids named like Hellcat and Charger. <laughs> Charger. A Charger. There's definitely a kid out there named Charger. Oh, oh for yeah. Sure. And his dad really wishes he was like Baby Gronk. Yeah. <laughs> Why can't you be like Baby Gronk? Why can't you riz up Lizzie? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get any press. You don't get any press. I have to do all your socials across all platforms. <laughs> Dad, I'm four years old. (laughs) After hearing that Chrysler was considering leaving, Durant hopped on the first train in Flint without so much as calling to set a meeting beforehand. Durant went directly to Chrysler's office unannounced and sat in front of his desk. As Chrysler tells the story, he intended to ask Durant for a raise until Durant beat him to it. William Durant offered William Chrysler $500,000 a year to stay as the head of Buick. (laughs) What? That's $14.5 million that's, nowadays. That's less than the CEO of Ford makes. 
Yeah, but this is back when a time when the gap was way closer. Right. That's insane. Now, oh, before money was fake? Yeah. Yeah. It was the largest salary anyone in the auto industry had ever been paid. For Buick! Huh. <laughs> 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 Look, I want that much money. Yeah, Can yeah. you milk me? <laughs> but Chrysler didn't just want money. He wanted autonomy. No interference from anyone at GM but Durant. Durant, knowing he couldn't afford to lose Chrysler, agreed. Although Durant's famously meddling and mercurial leadership style meant that he wouldn't be able to deliver on that promise, he had secured Chrysler's future at GM for the time being. I'd hope so. Like many auto companies at the time, GM relied heavily on a base of suppliers and contractors to source the parts that GM could use to build its automobiles. Ford's solution to this problem was extreme centralization and vertical integration, i.e. every part of every Ford was manufactured in Dearborn, Michigan. Rather than bring all parts manufacturing in-house as Ford had done, Durant envisioned a supply system made up of companies controlled by General Motors, but still independent enough to research and develop their own products rather than simply doing only what GM allowed them to do. Hmm. Okay. One such company that Durant was looking to acquire was the Hyatt Roller Bearing Company, owned and headed by Alfred Sloan. Durant acting on his own rather than as the head of GM so as to maintain leverage over the board, bought Hyatt Roller Bearing. But while Durant thought he was buying the company, he was really buying the man, Alfred Sloan, <laughs> Chick cha! You bought me! You bought me! I'm yours! <laughs> but I don't say no. Yeah, you thought you bought a company, but you really bought me! You bought me! <laughs> Let me get in your pocket! <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I'm yours! Let me get in your pocket! Carry me around! I'm yours! Okay, I mean, you're really cute, so. Wee! <laughs> <laughs> Sloan would come to be worth far more to GM than his original company was. Let's go, dude. Durant, Durant regret it. <laughs> I promise. Durant, a lifelong player of the stock market, was in a bad spot. A sizable amount of his fortune was tied up in GM stock, and Durant had used that stock as collateral for his other trades, mostly buying even more GM stock. As automotive journalist W.A.P. John put it, Durant was Wet quote, John. <laughs> John. <laughs> John. Durant was, quote, spurred by his sublime faith in the corporation he had conceived and created. I feel like that quote was included just it was yeah. included just so we could say yep. W A P John. Yeah. Wap John. Wap John. Macaroni in the pot, John. Oh, God. oh my God. <laughs> but in 1920, due to an overall business downturn, GM stock went from trading at 420 bucks oh, nice. oh, 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 oh. Uh, to just $12 a share. Oh, womp, womp. Dang. Suddenly, all the GM stock Durant had bought was worth way less than he had paid for it. His only option was to sell more stock that he had bought to pay the note. I just realized that the, the 12 is what uh, busts you for 420. Oh. <laughs> Everybody is driving and there's like, <laughs> 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 just fall asleep. <laughs> uh, feeling an obligation to GM shareholders, William C. Billy sought a bailout from GM's board. DuPont and the other members of the board initially reassured Durant that he could stay on at GM until. They saw how much Durant owed. Billy was in the red $20 million, which is the equivalent of over <laughs> $315 million today. If they let his vast holdings of stock hit the market, it would tank the value of the stock even lower, reducing confidence and perhaps impacting the balance sheets of other board members. I don't know how the stock market works. Yeah. <laughs> They're still making cars, right? Yeah. Who? GM. Yeah, like allegedly. Time, like, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. understand. Anyway, Durant, DuPont, and the rest of the board all knew that they'd have to bail Durant out, but that Durant would have to walk away from GM once again in return. 
December 1st, 1920 was William C. Billy Durant's last day at General Motors. At least he got Christmas off. <laughs> After signing a few papers in his office, he put on his coat and quipped, quote, May 1st is usually National Moving Day, but we seem to be moving on December 1st. <sighs> oh, <laughs> he's right. <laughs> what? Dur- yeah, what dude? <laughs> Durant walked out of the company he had built from the ground up for the very last time. Just nine years after the founding of Chevrolet, both the men who had started it were no longer involved with running it. Although Durant had some successes playing the stock market later in the 1920s, the Great Depression wiped out the last of his wealth, and he died a pauper in 1947. What? Wow. Pop, like a pimple popper? Like John Popper from Blues Traveler. <laughs> John Dude, Popper. Beber, who's the better MC? Eminem yeah. or John Popper? <laughs> That's Tra- a rap battle I would buy a ticket yeah. for. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Shopify. We move a lot of merchandise here at Donut Media. All those t-shirts and hoodies and all the other awesome apparel available. How do we get it to you? Well, we use a little service called Shopify. Start selling with Shopify today. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. We use Shopify here to move our apparel. We even have a past guest t-shirt available on our website, and you can get that all thanks to Shopify. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. 10%! And Shopify is truly a global force. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash gas. William Durant had made General Motors into a company, but Alfred Sloan would make it into an institution. Ooh. Educated at MIT, Sloan brought an engineer's cold calculus to business situations, whereas Durant had brought a sort of folksy salesmanship. And kind of a hard Hard business idiocy. Guy. Yeah. Sloan's GM was driven by balance sheets rather than personal relationships. In Sloan's view, GM would make, through its various marquees, a car for every person purpose. That's a good Sloan voice. <laughs> yeah, Sloan is, I have a picture, he's like Dexter. He's like Slytherin, kind of. Yeah, I'd have him played, <laughs> yeah. I'd have uh, either Rafe Fiennes mm. or the guy who played Dexter. It's definitely giving mm. me Slytherin, yeah. Uh, also, <laughs> is this Sloan from the toilets, too? In the urinals? Oh, oh, probably. Yeah. I mean, all these companies. We got a potty for every person purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Cadillac would handle the luxury market, with Buick, Oldsmobile, and Oakland, later named Pontiac, targeted toward the middle class. Oh, so Sloan's the dude who did this. Oh. Under Sloan's leadership, GM ushered in many changes that we take for granted today, such as the yearly model refresh. Whoa. Hmm. Planned obsolescence and dealer financing. True to Durant's vision, Chevrolet would remain a value-oriented brand under the GM umbrella. This stood in contrast to Ford, which still produced just one car. The ubiquitous Model T. To lead Chevrolet, Sloan poached former Ford executive William K. Knutson. (laughs) Yeah, Billy Knutson. Billy Knutson. Knutson had already achieved legendary status for designing the layout of Ford's regional assembly plants, but chafed at Henry Ford's haughty personal style. But the Chevrolet that Knutson took over was in dire straits. Great band. An outside study commissioned by the GM board recommended that the company kill the Chevrolet brand, the only presence at the low end of the market, due to a widespread belief that no one could possibly beat Ford at its own game of selling low-priced, mass-produced cars. But Knutson could beat Ford at his game. Chevrolet alone outsold all the Ford Motor Company for the first time in 1927, allowing the brand to emerge as perhaps the best known of the GM marquees. While Knutson would eventually leave GM, in 1940, at the request of FDR to oversee the production of war materials, 
His leadership of the brand helped it through a critical time in its history. Knudsen was effective at this job, too, when it came to his former company. Chevrolet churned out hundreds of thousands of trucks, aircraft engines, and armored cars during the course of the war. Do you think um, that's where they were like, oh, I, I was on a ship. It was called a Corvette. It was so fast. And they come back to the plant, and they're like... Is a Corvette a type of ship? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a little, it's a little warship. Yeah, they're like a warship. I'm not, I'm not sure what what they do, but they are like, yeah, a ship, smaller ship. Yeah, fast. it's like smaller. Yeah, they're fast. It's like smaller than a frigate. <laughs> yeah, watch your mouth, <laughs> frigate, frigate. I said it, mom, frigate. <laughs> <laughs> Like all car brands, Chevrolet was in an excellent position after the war. Government contracts had kept profits robust, and Americans returning home from overseas wanted suburban houses, roads, and cars to drive them on. I got a road. Now all I need is a car. (laughs) Wheelbases expanded almost as fast and as far as the profits. Due to its positioning as an entry-level brand, Chevy sold an untold volume of cars during this post-war period. Models like the Corvette, Suburban, Bel Air, and Impala were created or exploded in popularity during this time. Sloan eventually retired in 1956, having built a General Motors which employed over 800,000 people. Damn. More, yeah, more than any other entity in America other than the federal government. Other than uh, Alabama football. <laughs> yeah, well, other than, uh, yeah, Nick Saban. <laughs> But despite the success of Chevrolet models, what they lacked was safety. In 1965, an up-and-coming lawyer named Ralph Nader Nader. (laughs) published a book uh, which took aim squarely at one of Chevrolet's most economical models, the Corvair. The Corvair was unique among American cars, and then it came equipped with an air-cooled rear-mounted motor. Although the air-cooled motor was lighter and cheaper than other motors of the time, its rear placement meant that a large amount of weight was placed on the rear wheels. This, coupled with a suspension system which very much did not come equipped with anti-roll bars, meant that the Corvair had an unfortunate tendency to oversteer and flip over. Given the lax attitude towards automobile safety at the time, no seat belts or airbags, easily shattered windows, steering columns with a predisposition for impalement, a flipped car often resulted in death. Like All- every car accident resulted in death. Yeah. Although subsequent testing would reveal that Corvairs were no more dangerous than similar cars of the era when tire pressures were proper, I meaning they really they had to like deflate the tires pretty uh-huh. hard because uh, the the sidewall would then act as like more suspension basically. But at the dealers, a lot of those tires were just filled all the way up. Yeah. The reputational damage to Chevrolet lingered. In his memoir, On a Clear Day, You Can See General Motors, former head of Chevrolet and friend of the pod, John DeLorean, admitted (laughs) that (laughs) Nader's view of Chevrolet for putting profits first and safety second was generally correct, writing, quote, this is John DeLorean. At General Motors, the concern for the effect of our products on many publics was never discussed except in terms of cost and sales potential. <laughs> when the safety of the car was called into question by, uh, what's his freaking name? <laughs> Nerder. <laughs> the corporate reaction was just as irrational as the approval of the, cor- of the Corvair. Nader was tailed and spied upon. Wow. And he did a bunch of nerdy crap. <laughs> All he did was go to the freaking library and hang out with his <laughs> dumb kids. <laughs> Federally mandated safety regulations ultimately came into effect, and the Corvair was eventually equipped with an anti-roll bar suspension system. Chevrolet's story for much of the rest of the 20th century up to today is essentially the story of the American car industry at large. Reliability problems, rising costs, and a series of lawsuits dog GM and Chevrolet in the 1970s and early 80s. Lethargic oil crisis cars led people to Japanese competitors, although the switch away from sedans and towards trucks and SUVs was ultimately a boon for Chevrolet, whose long-standing suburban model was in prime position to capture a public looking for oversized cars to go with their subprime mortgages. <laughs> The sh- big fat dummies, big <laughs> just dumb, gr- dummy, sh- dumb place to live. We're dumb. We stink. Calorie dense food. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
It's one thing about America, like all of our food is like super calorie dense. Yeah. And, like we don't need like I gotta I hit just, my macros. I just read about this because you can go to France and eat a ton of bread and cheese yeah. and not feel gross. Yeah. I can't wait. But it's the way <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Dude, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. But like a cheeseburger has got like eight hundred calories in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ah. It's just like dense. Yeah. yeah. The Chevrolet of today is still heavily reliant on gasoline powered trucks and cars for its revenue. Although its EV models, the Bolt and Bolt EUV, do they make those even? The Bolt, yeah. Not they, the, the Volt. No, the Volt is, which, the was Volt is like a hybrid thing. Volt is great. Whalen's got a Volt. Yeah, it's really it. nice. Although it's EV models, the Bolt and Bolt EUV seek to offer a lower price electric alternative to standard economy cars. I was looking at Bolts for a long time. Were you? Yeah. What did you decide? That I want an engine. Yeah. <laughs> Although the Chevrolet of today remains a balance sheet driven corporate behemoth in the vein pictured by Sloan, the freewheeling style of Durant and racing heritage of Louis Chevrolet still live on in the company. Chevrolet's Corvette racing program recently celebrated their ninth class win and first for the Corvette C8 at Le Mans. Wow. In the country of Louis Chevrolet's childhood. France, uh, which Nolan is about to go to. Oh, sh- wow! Full circle. Full circle. Full we did like a purpose. wheel on a Chevy. <laughs> Nolan's going to Spain. Then Nolan's going to Portugal. Then Nolan's going to the south of France, Nice. And then I'm going to Monaco. And, and then, he's going then to Monaco. maybe Italy. Then maybe I've, Italy. I've heard that they the rental car companies. If you take it to another country, they charge you like four hundred dollars. Is what I heard. Yeah. yeah, but maybe you'll be in Monaco, and maybe you just put it all on black. Oh, yeah, that's actually put your car on black. That's my. That's my. <laughs> yeah, that's you're playing, what dude. What if you win? Just like like you're like. Okay, I'll just go. Okay, yeah, but, and then I never come win back. Win like <laughs> one point seven million dollars. Yeah, yeah. I and win the jackpot. Sherlock Leclerc is like, yeah, move in with me and hey. you roommate. Hey, yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Chloe yeah. and I are living with <laughs> yeah. Charles Leclerc. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we, you're pretty funny. We hey, <laughs> you're very fun to hang out with. I want to hang out with yeah Charles Leclerc, freaking Pierre yeah. Gasly. Yeah, you just become like F one. I'm just in with the boys, yeah. dude. Yeah. That'd, That'd be, be cool. sick, That'd dude. Be sick. I hope that happens. Me too. I'll miss you, yeah, but yeah, I hope yeah. that like, happens, dude. That'd be sick. We got some listener mail this week, as we do every week. This is from Drake, a former Indiana boy turned Minnesota hating man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, past gas crew. This is Drake, formerly from Brazil, Indiana. Uh, the, that's a country. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> now from the Minnesota hating state of Milwaukee. That's a city, not a state. (laughs) That one was on you. Uh, You may remember a few months ago that I had counted all the deaths in past gas, and I said I would update the list at episode 200. After listening to episode 200, I have finished the list, and I will finally stop focusing on all the death in the show. I will not go into depth about the rules for what I counted as a death, but... If you need a reminder, like, okay, yeah, because there's like some mass casualty events that we talked yeah, about. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you need a reminder from the previous email, was read at the end of episode 174. As of episode 200, the amount of deaths read by each host is as follows: James, 1,384 <laughs> plus one dog. <laughs> Nolan. Oh my God. 1,222. <laughs> Wait, did something happen? Like there must have been, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, our like car crashes, episode. like recalls, must have been included in yeah. that. Oh, something yeah, like maybe. that. Yeah, yeah. Th- it has to. No like, way of named insane. an individual <laughs> two thousand death. Yeah. Wow. Joe two hundred four. That's more than I thought that I've read. Jeremiah eighteen deaths. Alanis eighteen deaths. Elizabeth eight deaths. Zach Job five deaths. Christina zero and Andy zero. Wow. Andy was on his uh, on an episode. One yeah. episode, yeah, man. Oh, wow. wow, dude, okay. honest Drake, great yeah. freaking. Dude, I cannot work. believe that Drake is yeah. such a huge fan. Well, Milwaukee's kind of close to Canada, so that he has he has like a summer residence. Don't there. and you're my everything. Uh, I would continue the list, but unfortunately, I don't have the time to keep track of all these deaths anymore. Ever since what? graduating college what? and getting an actual job, nice, dude. no, nice. Uh, oh. However, I do encourage someone to please go back and make a list of every time James mentions Mario Andretti's purple underpants. 
I love you guys and keep up all your hard work. Drake, a former Indiana boy turned Minnesota hating man. man. I was running through Good. the six with my whoa. Just like lost another one to the <laughs> man. Yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. can't all of our that, fans that letter, perpetually stay in school? That letter was like basically like, hey, can't do any of this fun stuff anymore, guys. I got a <laughs> freaking job I now. Got a job. I don't bye. even got a commute anymore. I really feel like we just said bye to Drake. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye, Drake. Goodbye, Drake. We'll Enjoy the grind. Have <laughs> we'll uh I'll see you on I the other side. I hope you listen to us like once every five weeks uh-huh. just to check in and be like, huh, all right, they're still pretty good, and then stop <laughs> listening halfway through an episode. <laughs> No, he's got a <laughs> no. He's got a commute now. Oh, maybe he'll listen to us more. I bet make more podcasts. Nah, for Drake. he's in Milwaukee. I bet that he now he he's gonna buy like an electric bicycle what? and then go to work. Do what you, about winter? Have dumbass. you ever been in Milwaukee? Huh? Do you do you think that everyone in Milwaukee drives electric bikes? I mean, it'd be pleasant as hell to do that. That city's beautiful. What are you talking for about? For like two yeah, months, that's true. Yeah, for yeah. the spring to summer. Uh that's like two months. Oh, yeah. The rest of the time, it's cold. Yeah. When does it get? Well, nice. it it snows in I'd say January is when it really snows, and it snows until March, April. Oh wow! But it's rainy and cloudy for I'd say like okay seven well, to eight I would, months out of the year. When we go back to your parents' house, Joe, let's get some electric bikes. Yeah, ride them down to that brewery we went to under the bridge. Lakefront Brewery. Yeah, Lakefront. Hit that fish fry. Yes, dude. So I dream cool. about that. Okay, Bye. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for listening to this. This was a fun one, guys. This yeah, was fun. This was, was fun. I can't wait to go into my wet closet. I can't wait to go into my wet closet and suck on some horse dunks with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> like men. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.